Luther, even though October 31st is passed and no one would be interested in it again for 50 more years, I thought. But here we are in February and people still talking about it. Well, uh, toward the start of that classic film of American higher education, Back to School, we suddenly encounter a highly incongruous sight, Rodney Dangerfield in the middle of a university bookstore. He loudly orders some t-shirts and beer mugs, declares that used books are rubbish, engages in what Catherine Deneuve would call clumsy flirting, and then finally yells out to the students in the vicinity that the next round of books is on him. Shakespeare for everybody, he yells, to a chorus of appreciative cheers. Well, that last bit is something like what an editor at Oxford University Press had in mind when he approached me in very late 2014 with the idea of writing a book about Martin Luther to go along with a thousand or so others uh, slated to appear in 2017 in time for the 500th anniversary of Luther's 95 Theses. And my first response was protest. I'm no Luther specialist, I said. I'm not even a German specialist. And he said, oh, I know. He said this triumphantly, as if this somehow clinched the argument for him. He wanted a book for non-specialists by a non-specialist, and I was apparently eminently qualified to do that. <laughs> So yes, Luther for everybody was what he wanted. And my second response was therefore, here's my chance to put up or shut up. I'd complained for years that American readers want only books about already famous subjects instead of the obscure sorts that I prefer. And here was the most famous Reformation subject of all. And so I agreed after, of course, extracting from the editor a promise of sufficient damages to compensate for the thrashing I was sure to get from actual Luther scholars. But I still found the whole business nerve-wracking, because how could a non-specialist find something fresh to say about a fellow who supposedly had more books written about him than anybody but Jesus himself, especially when a tight deadline is looming? Of course, every historian will tell a story slightly differently from the next, but in Luther's case, I felt like a puzzled friend who once asked me why I need to go to Europe every year to do historical research. Don't we already know everything there is to know about the past? I quickly set my friend straight, but I have to admit in thinking about Luther that I was inclined to agree with him. I, like most historians, I don't mind repeating myself on a disturbingly regular basis, but I didn't want to be seen simply repeating what other historians had said. But to find something fresh about Luther, I imagine you had to be something like a Kremlin watcher from the 1970s, able to detect meaning and even the slightest change in facial expression or waving technique uh, of the various Soviet officials standing atop the Kremlin during a parade. Of course, most general readers don't usually care about how fresh your version of the story is. As another friend said, when readers walk into a bookstore and see a stack of books on Luther, they don't say, gee, I wonder how this interpretation differs from somebody else's, but instead, oh, here's a subject that I, as an educated person, feel almost obligated to know and should therefore probably buy this book if not actually read it. But wouldn't most of my fellow educated Americans already know the basics of Luther's story anyway, I thought, um, which is about all I would be able to tell them. As Dermot McCulloch has pointed out, the U.S. was created by the Enlightenment, but it's always seemed a lot more like the Reformation, it sounded a lot more like the Reformation. So surely my fellow Americans knew something. Well, not exactly. My assumption showed me again the ivory-towered quality of my life, which I learned when I started actually asking people about this. Thank you. 
I'm not too sure about it. Can you just tell me it's better? Uh, Martin Luther King? Martin. My history is so bad. Martin Luther King. Oh, Martin Luther King! Yeah, is that old? No! Oh, no. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. The main of the prominent figures in my mind are that's not Martin Luther. Are you good? I want to say something along the lines of Martin Luther, but uh, probably all. No. Really? You're right. Oh my gosh, Jerry! I know something. <laughs> what do you know about it? What did you do? And he didn't let him just kick him off the bus and get out for himself. The English monarchy wanted to impose something or other, and he said, hell no, and broke off and got his own church. That is a great guess. These are my sins, my bad, my sins. <laughs> was it the, the 29 theses? How many theses was it? Is that the, the 99 theses that he did? Was it 101 or something? He nailed the 50 theses. He nailed the 100 theses. 96, I think it was? 95 theses. Luther nailed the 95 theses on the Edinburgh door. That's when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses. Whether or not he nailed it on to the Catholic Church door is uh, debatable. Any idea what, what profession he had? He was writing theses? He was a writer. <laughs> yeah, he was definitely a writer. Was he a professor? Was he like a professor? He was a theologian. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was a professor at the University of Wittenberg. I don't remember what else. Oh, was. Something like that. Yeah, in the end, they went in Yes, but not in the sense of maybe what you're talking about. <laughs> they still sell them in the game in Mexico. <laughs> and this day, that's no joke. Like food or drink or? Um, yeah, they do that every single Saturday with ice cream and stuff. So indulgences were a fee that you would pay to remove Temporal effects of sin. And so we thought that some practices needed to be changed or reformed. Please tell me you've been prepped for this interview, right? Yeah, I'm going to stay recording. I passed. I passed. Yeah. Shut up, I'm okay. Alright, have you got a pass? Thank you so much. That's so nice of you. Ask me if you got a pass, Kelly. I have a pass. You owe me a complaint. Thanks a lot. There we go. Well, as Professor McCulloch has also pointed out, those who call themselves religious traditionalists tend to be those who do not know enough about their religious tradition. <laughs> well, still, I was very proud of that missionary right out of central casting for the Book of Mormon musical who astonished me by knowing all the answers cold and also of the one student who is a computer science major but who listened carefully in his history of civilization class. Well, so against this backdrop of self-doubt and widespread ignorance and uncomfortably tight deadline, I set out to research and write, trying to find an angle that might make the story a millimeter or two different from the countless other versions available, and that might also grab the attention of general readers without pandering to them by repeating the usual grave cliches they'd almost come to expect. To get up to some semblance of speed on the Luther basics, I decided to go to Wittenberg for an entire week. That may not sound like much, especially compared to the months that Lyndall Roper spent there in the archives, but I didn't have time for archives. And if you've ever been to Wittenberg, you will know what an accomplishment a week is. I at least wanted to have the 16th century layout of the town planted firmly in my mind before I started writing, and I wanted to memorize the famous Luther Museum and have a look at key texts and possible illustrations there. I wrote the museum more than once to arrange a visit, but I never got a response. When I went in person to acquire about illustrations and permissions, the person at the desk said she couldn't help me and acted as if my suggestion or questions were the strangest thing in the world. I walked away bewildered, and then five minutes later, when I was safely around the corner, an apologetic staff member who'd overheard the conversation came running and furtively handed me a card with the name and address of the person I needed, and then quietly disappeared. <laughs> Well, what I mostly did, though, was, of course, to start reading in the overwhelming mountain of both primary and secondary sources about Luther. The first thing I noticed was how many books for the 2017 anniversary were even more about the consequences of Luther's actions than about the actions themselves. And this makes a lot of sense. Um, something is celebrated or commemorated because its consequences are still with us and connect us to those original events. And the consequences of Luther's actions were so big and the connections to the present so strong that they have been commemorated not just by all the usual oddball scholarly societies, 
but by all the markers of genuine popular, popular fame in our world, such as Playmobil figures, uh, T-shirts, of course, beer, old Lutheran, sin boldly, and the socks, which are my favorite. But one consequence of focusing on consequences is that they can overshadow or blur the original events and become something that the original actors themselves wouldn't recognize. Plenty of other books, though, have indeed focused on the original events involving Luther, which was what I wanted to do as well. There were helpful classics by Roland Bainton and Martin Brecht and Heiko Obermann, and more recent contributions by Peter Marshall, Andrew Pedigree, and, of course, Lyndall Roper. Although I enjoyed her book very much, I was almost finished with my writing by the time I saw it, and had I at that point read it all the way through, I would have curled up into the fetal position out of discouragement, and I had no time for that because my deadline was looming. Still, my book would have been better if I had integrated some of her insights, including into the mining economy around Luther's hometown, into how Luther's network of friends in South German cities galvanized support for him, into how Luther's theology changed over time, none of which I think I developed sufficiently. And I especially would have benefited from her ideas and suggestions about his inner life, his ability and even need to get himself noticed, uh, the depth of his tension with his father, which I think she probably does well or better than anyone, the psychological state Luther was in just before his crucial talk with Cayetan in Augsburg, or the difficult relationship between Luther and Karlstadt, or especially between Luther and von Staupitz, all of which I found among the best things written on the subject. But what I probably liked most about Lindell's book was that she used even more probablys, maybes, perhapses, mights, mayhaves, couldhaves, and possiblys than I usually do. And I find such words quite necessary in my rather novelistic way of writing history. But Professor Roper's use of conditional and conjectural language, necessitated especially by her use of psychoanalysis, made me feel like an absolute positivist. Still, her book was all the more interesting for it, too, I think, probably. Right. <laughs> but the point is that besides books about the consequences of Luther's actions, there were plenty of books about those actions themselves. And what I noticed most in these books was just how hard it is to write about such a big and famous event, a series of events, without having the consequences and the outcome already in mind as you go. In other words, it's difficult and maybe even impossible to tell Luther's story without seeing it from your vantage point hundreds of years later. And that, of course, does something to the story. It can sap out all the drama. It can make the outcome and consequences seem inevitable. And most of all, it breaks the spell of another world. The tendency to excessively foreshadow, to read things backwards, to trot out the big cliches is especially striking among non-historians who are always abundant in anniversary years. Among actual historians, the result of having the outcome in mind is usually more subtle and doesn't usually involve blatant anachronism or old cliches, but more that we can't resist saying intelligent things about why the event being discussed mattered at the time or what it meant for the future or how it might be understood by us today. In other words, we can't resist, of all things, explicitly interpreting and explaining. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Most historians would argue that's exactly what a historian is supposed to do. But the price for making even the most intelligent of interjections is that they can break the spell of a story set in another time and place, if you really want to understand it in that time and place. So I thought to myself, what if I refrain from saying intelligent things? What would happen to even this famous story if it were told with the outcome and Luther's outsized historical stature and our modern vantage point as little as possible in mind? What would happen if the reader were set into Luther's world as much as possible, unprotected, unfettered by modern sensibilities and understanding? And what if the focus were on the first five years of the story from 1517 to 22, when the most famous events occurred precisely when it might be most interesting and helpful to see him and events at their most uncertain and tenuous and human. And I thought all this not only because I was trying to find an angle, but because it's precisely the spell of another time and place that attracted me to the study of history in the first place. It's not necessarily a superior way of working, but it's the way that I like to work. Of course, it's not a terribly original way either. Novelists work like this all the time, and some historians or writers of nonfiction have tried it as well but it's far easier to say than to do. In fact, it, again, it's maybe impossible given all the practical and conscious and unconscious obstacles involved. How in the world can you tell a story without knowing the ending because that's how you develop plot and timing and more. Even novels love to do some foreshadowing and drop hints of what's to come. 
It's also probably a little silly to pretend that you and everyone else can act like you don't know the ending to a story as famous as Luther's. And even sillier to act like you don't know the ending when your book ends up with a title and subtitle that sound completely cliched and forward-looking. You also probably cannot tell a story of another world using only the thoughts and language of that world. And maybe most fundamentally, you can't say you're going to tell a story without the outcome in mind when you also say that you're going to treat only the five most dramatic years of that story because, of course, you picked only those five years precisely because you do know the outcome. But as the Reformation scholar Brad Gregory likes to say in this context, no one can completely sterilize an operating room either, and yet there are serious benefits to trying. And so, and here I feel like John Cleese in the uh, What Have the Romans Done for Us scene, apart from the many obstacles to entering a past world, apart from it being really hard to tell a story without knowing the ending, apart from pretending you don't know the ending to a famous story, apart from the facts that the title and subtitle imposed on you by the publisher say one thing while the inside of the book says another, and apart from the problem of focusing on five years precisely because you do know the ending, what if the story were told as relentlessly as possible from the viewpoint of the actors? And what if this sort of telling involved not only the usual avoidance of anachronism and of reading backwards and of explicitly interpreting, but showing instead of telling, not simply stating that something was uncertain and tenuous, but helping the reader feel uncertain and tenuous, feel the same sort of uncertainty about the outcome that we might feel living in the world of Donald Trump. One benefit to seeing a story as much as possible in its original context is that it should help you more accurately trace the consequences of that story over time, to see your genealogical connections to it. But the benefit I cared about most, I think, was that putting yourself in another world can help you connect more immediately to it in a more personal way, even add, in a sense, to your own experience, to your own bag of things to think with. It's pretty ethereal, I think, but here I found support from Emerson, who's always good for an ethereal thought. The fact narrated must correspond to something in me to be credible or intelligible. We, as we read, must become Greeks, Romans, Turks, priest and king, martyr and executioner, must fasten these images to some reality in our secret experience, or we shall learn nothing rightly. This semi-experiential approach to old events is also behind a long tradition of meditation practiced in Catholic religious orders, as among the Passionist monks I studied this past summer. If you want to understand Jesus' passion, they say, it's not enough to ponder a little corner of Palestine 2,000 years ago. Instead, you have to actually put yourself there at the moment, see it right in front of your feet, practically touch and smell and hear it. And then you might begin to understand how it went and what it might mean for you. Now, this is all rather airy and imprecise and foreign to how we often talk about history because it's more about an emotional than an intellectual experience. But it resonates with me, and I thought maybe it would resonate with some others. So this is how I approached and tried to carry out my study of Luther. I'll spend most of the rest of the time in good academic fashion, not so much showing as telling, and focusing on the parts of the story that I thought most needed clarifying, including, of course, the place of the Sermon on Indulgences and Grace that we're here to celebrate today. I hope it's not all too familiar, but when it comes to knowing details about Luther, I've learned to take nothing for granted. One of the first things I wanted to clarify or emphasize by setting the story firmly in Luther's time was not so much his upbringing, because biographies do that, biographers do that very thoroughly, but the university culture that did so much to shape him and his theology, and that, of course, produced his theses. You undoubtedly know this culture better than my fellow Americans, including what subjects were available for study at university, the methods of teaching, and how few actually attended university. Only one in 100 people ever attended in Luther's time, maybe partly because you had to survive the floggings and humiliations that were the hallmark of all early schooling in order to learn enough Latin to enroll. And Luther did survive, and he started at the University of Erfurt in 1501 when he was 18. When he got there, only three in 10 people of the time ever actually earned a degree at university. Three in 10 people who attended university atten actually earned a degree. And Luther earned two of them at Erfurt. First in 1502, a Bachelor of Arts degree, and then in early 1505, a Master of Arts degree. His father wanted him to earn a third degree as well in law, which is one of the three subjects available for advanced degrees besides the arts, compared to the 40 or so programs now available at Oxford, for instance. And so young Luther dutifully started his legal studies in May 1505. Now, the methods of instructions in these subjects have been around since the start, centuries before, 
the lecture, recitation, and disputation. Lectures and recitation, I'm sure, are familiar enough to you, but disputations now tend to be organized separately at universities but into debating society, societies and clubs, like the famous Oxford Union. But in Luther's time, disputations were built into the curriculum, and all students who earned degrees had to participate. Disputations tended to be held on subjects that needed urgent solving. And to this end, a professor or student drew up a series of theses, or as they were then called, articles or propositions, to be disputed. There could be any number of theses, from three to 900, of numbers that I've seen, it didn't matter. What mattered was to compose as many as you felt were necessary to address the problem that needed solving. You exaggerated, you certainly provoked in order to bring out the issues fully. You didn't necessarily believe what you wrote. Once written, the theses were given to the disputants so that they could prepare proofs for their respective positions, for or against the theses, and they would present these then during the disputation itself. The hope of all this was that some sort of clarity might emerge out of the fray. There were practice disputations every Friday at Luther's University for students, and there were occasional public disputations as well, such as at graduation, because what better way to celebrate something big than with several hours of fine-sliced arguing in Latin? I'm sure the parents were delighted to sit through all this. In any case, it was in the centuries-old tradition of lectures and disputations that Luther learned to formulate and express his ideas. Luther lasted only a few weeks in the study of law, of course, because in July 1505, he quit to enter a monastery, which raises the next part of the story that I wanted to clarify, the spiritual crisis that led to this action and eventually to his theology of justification by faith. Given the later importance of justification in Protestantism, most Protestants still see it as see its emergence as the chief cause of the Reformation. But seeing the story in its time modifies that image. Most people weren't rallying around justification at all. The reasons for Luther's crisis, specifically for his sense that he can never be saved, are explained very nicely by Professor Roper and others, but suffice it to say that entering a monastery was a classic way to improve your chances of being saved. Luther chose to enter the Augustinian monastery in er Erfurt, partly because the Augustinians were strict, which he thought would be good for his soul, and partly because of their tradition of biblical theology, which would give him the answers he sought, he hoped. Augustinians were not monks who withdrew from the world, but friars who tried to find God out in the world, including at the university. And it was at the university that real action in theology lay. But neither Luther's famously heroic deprivations nor the theology that he started studying in 1507 did the trick for him. The dominant theology of salvation taught in universities at the time had been developed by so-called scholastics, who had built up rational systems of Christian theology with the help of Plato and especially Aristotle. In many ways, Luther was a scholastic himself, but he disliked the answer to the question of how you were saved. And it was this, do all that lies within you, and God will do the rest. That never worked for Luther. No matter how much he did, he thought of how much more he could do. How would he ever know that he had done all that lay within him? And the idea that humans had enough good inside to actually do good did not come from the Bible, he was sure, which said no such thing. It said it came from pagan Aristotle, who was fine for logic or the shape of the universe, but who didn't know a thing about salvation. Now, scholastics were not saying that you, could, you did have enough good inside to save yourself. Everyone, they said, was ultimately saved or justified by God's grace, as the church had always taught. But the scholastics did agree with Aristotle that you did have enough good inside to improve yourself. In Christian terms, that you could do enough good to get your soul to a sort of halfway station between sin and grace, and at that point, your will could cooperate with God's in order to do what was necessary for salvation. And this was justification by grace through doing every blessed thing you possibly could. There had to be better answers, thought Luther, and so he kept studying. He studied so well, in fact, that his superiors awarded, wanted him to become not only a master of theology, but a doctor and professor of biblical theology at the new University of Wittenberg. And he was made Dr. Martinez in October 1512, and he started lecturing in uh, 1513 in Wittenberg, not quite 30 years of age. But of course, while he lectured, he kept studying, and now often outside of the scholastic sort of theology taught at university. He learned as well from monastic theology, for instance, which was around long before scholastics or universities. And that the key to the salvation key to salvation in their theology was to admit how sinful you were and to beg God to save you. This might be framed 
as justification by grace through humility. This was an improvement for Luther, but this too would leave him with the same nagging question that arose with do all that lies within you. How humble do you have to be? He found comfort in the church fathers, including Augustine, who said that to do anything truly good, God had to first fill you with his grace at his initiative. Luther also learned from the spiritual writers, later called mystics, who urged Gelassenheit, or completely resigning yourself to your sinfulness and passively letting God fill you with his grace. And Luther learned from the men of letters, later called humanists, to study the Bible in its original languages, which changed his understanding of words like penance. As early as 1515, when he started lecturing on Paul's letters to the Romans, Luther began bringing these pieces, of, um, these pieces and Paul's letters into his own more comforting theology of salvation. Though, as Professor Roper suggests, maybe he didn't fully develop it until 1519. Everybody's always arguing about that. Like the monastic tradition, it said you couldn't do anything to save yourself. Like the spiritual writers, it said you could only open your heart and plead with God to save you. Like Augustine, it said you couldn't do good unless God first filled you with grace. But it disagreed with Augustine's point uh, that the point was then to do good that could then save you. No, your sinful nature remained, insisted Luther. It just wasn't held against you anymore. You were covered with grace just as Ruth was covered with a cloak of Boaz. This was justification by grace through faith alone. And this was Luther's big idea, the foundation for the rest of his theology that has become justly famous, the idea that freed him from his personal torments, at least most of the time, some of the time. He wasn't the first to arrive at it, as he himself insisted. In other words, it was a Catholic idea, even more so than the other two ideas on salvation already mentioned. But the very fact that there was more than one idea and tradition was precisely what made Luther decide that he had to clarify things. It was his job, remember, as a professor of theology to settle doctrine that had not been entirely settled by the church. And justification was just such a thing. And of course, the best way he knew how to settle such a problem was with disputation and write up a bunch of theses for it. So in August 1517, he drew up 99 of them for his disputation against scholastic theology, by which he meant especially the scholastic view of salvation. The prospect made him nervous, he admitted, because his disputation would challenge widely held ideas in the most public forum a professor of the time could imagine, the disputation hall. Or maybe he enjoyed that sort of thing more than he admitted, as Professor Roper suggests. As usual, Luther had a secretary take the theses after he wrote them to the local printer, or he might have taken them himself to the printer so the printer could make several dozen copies at Luther's expense for people who would be attending and disputing, or also for friends who couldn't attend. To publicize the event, or Luther, or more likely the university beetle, then walked with a copy of the theses to the southwest corner of town and glued or nailed them to the door of the university church, which was the university bulletin board, and where all sorts of other announcements might be hanging too. This is an image from the Luther film, and although it gets a lot of things wrong, I think it gets this particular scene very right. There should have been a lot of things on that door and not just Luther's 95 theses, or 99 theses in this case. This big and upsetting disputation against scholastic theology was held on September 4th in this very church at the graduation ceremony of one of Luther's students. And a few sparks surely flew, but even more surely heads nodded because there was no big reaction at all. A couple of Luther's old professors at Erfurt weren't happy with his theses, um, but that was about it. Most people yawned, and the point is Luther's theology of justification by faith was still Catholic enough in 1517 to avoid serious negative attention. It wouldn't even be declared heretical by Rome until 1545. But Luther's disputation on the subject did matter, mostly in showing that he was ready to put his reading of the Bible above the church's current reading. And of course, this would be important in the next issue I wanted to clarify and to see through the eyes of the actors, which was indulgences. These images show very nicely the common view of the beginning of that issue, the posting of the 95 Theses. And you see there's a crowd around. It's the only thing on the door. It looks all very monumental. This one is even better. I love this one. Um, but the, the, the posting the Theses on a university bulletin board, as we know, was not a big event. So there was probably no crowd. The, we'll see that the 95 were not an unprecedentedly long list of miscellaneous complaints against the church, or even a call for banning indulgences. They might not even have been posted in this case. 
And Luther was hardly the first or only Catholic to complain about indulgences. So Luther, indulgences were a trivial subject he would have rather not bothered with so he could get on with his theology of justification. He only encountered them because in addition to being a university pre preacher or professor, he was also the city preacher of Wittenberg in the city's only parish church of St. Mary's. And some in his flock seemed to like indulgences and he wanted to investigate why. We had learned that they had been around since about 1100 as part of the sacrament of penance. And everybody knew that penance required three things, being contrite, uh, confessing to receive absolution, and then satisfaction, or in Latin, doing enough, which meant some sort of this worldly punishment to help make up your sin. This could be a prayer or pilgrimages and so on. But sometimes you couldn't carry out your punishment because you got sick or you even died. And how could you make it up? And yes, you did have to make it up even if you died. Well, the church offered two solutions meant to be merciful. The first was purgatory, but everybody knew that punishment there hurt like hell. Much preferred was therefore the second solution, and indulgence in this life, um, a document that changed your punishment to something manageable, usually including some sort of offering. In 1485, the Pope had declared that you could also use an indulgence to get your loved ones out of purgatory. In a world terrified of sudden death and purgatory, indulgences were understandably popular. They were also popular financially among princes, bishops, and towns because they were a sure way to raise money for churches, bridges, and yes, universities. The city church of Wittenberg, the University of Wittenberg itself, were built like so many other institutions on indulgences. Luther concluded from his study that indulgences were fine if they were rightly used. The problem was, in his view, they were not. They had come to look like a straight financial transaction that forgave sins and kept you out of purgatory altogether rather than merely forgiving the temporal punishment assigned to sin. Various theologians had criticized indulgences for centuries and they'd gotten into trouble for it, but Luther decided to join the chorus first during a lecture in class in 1514 and then during two sermons in 1516, including in the university church, which was owned by his boss, Prince Frederick of Saxony, who was effectively one of the biggest indulgence distributors in the world. Preaching like that in Frederick's church was brazen enough, but even more brazen was when Luther started attacking the latest craze in indulgences, the new St. Peter's indulgence from Rome, which reached German soil in early 1517. It was so-called because the offerings to it would be used to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral. That was very routine. The promise it made of forgiving sins, though, rather than just satisfaction, and of keeping people out of purgatory, really disturbed Luther. His mentor, Johann von Staupitz, urged him to do something serious this time, not just a lecture or a sermon, but the biggest weapon and forum a professor could imagine, what else, a disputation. Why shouldn't he? Because like justification, indulgences were an unsettled doctrine. And so very soon after the thud of his disputation against scholastic theology, he wrote another set of theses for what he called a disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences. He wanted to have them ready by All Saints' Eve of October 31st because All Saints was one of the biggest days of the year at the university church for pilgrims coming in search of indulgences. It was also a traditional day at the university for posting theses for upcoming disputations. The problem was indulgences weren't just another unsettled subject because of who was in charge of them, the Pope himself. Indulgences were possible because the saints in Christ had done more good works than they needed to be saved, and that excess of good works was deposited into a treasury of merits controlled by the Pope, which he redistributed in the form of indulgences. So if you criticize indulgences, you really ran the risk of criticizing the Pope. Luther went ahead insisting that he wasn't going to write against the Pope or indulgences, only their misuse. Maybe he was naive, maybe he was calculating. Either way, this time he wrote until he had 95 theses. Most did indeed avoid explicit, explicit mention of the Pope, but plenty implicated him. And there were eight that said, what were priests to say to lay people who asked, isn't the Pope rich enough to build St. Peter's himself? And isn't the Pope merciful enough to let people out of purgatory for free? But the 95 Theses did not call for an end to indulgences altogether. He had the usual several dozen copies printed for disputants and friends. He might also have walked 13 minutes down the partly cobblestone street and posted them on the university's church's door, but he very well might not have, because no disputation was ever held with these theses. Luther knew that princes had canceled disputations before on sensitive subjects, and indulgences were such a subject. A safer course, therefore, would have been just to send them around. And that is certainly what he did on October 31st. 
Besides sending them to friends, he sent them to two nearby bishops and to the archbishop over the area, Albrecht of Mainz, who was also in charge of the indulgence in German lands. One bishop was enthusiastic. One said the theses were Catholic, but too sensitive to dispute, and Archbishop Albrecht was thoroughly peeved. He forwarded everything to the Pope. The last thing he wanted was some professor criticizing indulgences in a disputation because the big secret about the St. Peter's indulgence was that it was also Albrecht's indulgence. Albrecht's debt is well known. Back in 1514, he had borrowed about 30,000 golden from his banking friends, the Fuggers, to pay for various church offices he held. One of the Fugger accountants, or one of the popes, came up with the fairly predictable solution of Albrecht allowing a new papal indulgence to be preached in Albrecht's lands. Half the proceeds would go to St. Peter's, thus the name of the indulgence, and the other half would go secretly to the Fuggers. The Fuggers estimated this new indulgence would bring in about 73,000 golden, based on their experience, half of which would easily cover Albrecht's debt. The big surprise was not that the pope or the Fuggers thought of this solution. The big surprise would have been if nobody had thought of it. Another surprise that I thought worth mentioning in the book was that besides the theological problems, this indulgence seemed to have financial ones too. By now, German lands were the burnt over district for papal indulgences. People had spent vast sums on them for decades, and many had had enough, especially when the new one said that all past indulgences were vo void. You had to buy a new one for them to be any good. And so sales of the new indulgence were sluggish, and Luther's criticism might slow it even more, thought Albrecht. Well, while Albrecht compared to the Pope, his main indulgence preacher, the famous Johann Tetzel, went after Luther in what else? A disputation at the University of Frankfurt on der Oder with over 100 theses of his own defending indulgences, insisting that if the Pope allowed them and sponsored them, that was okay. That was good enough. If you were against indulgences, you were against the Pope. This was precisely the connection Luther always tried to avoid, tried to separate indulgences and the Pope, but his rivals always insisted on. Yet that was also the thing that his supporters found so interesting about Luther. They liked that idea. And that made his theses far more popular than Tetzel's 106. In fact, for the first and probably last time in Western history, a set of academic theses suddenly started selling surprisingly well. It happened because some of Luther's friends took copies of the 95 to a couple of printers to send to other friends, and profit-conscious printers quickly saw that there might be a market here, not so much because people were keen on the finer points of theology, but because they saw what everybody but Luther seemed to see, that they couldn't help but criticize the Pope. And at the moment, there was a market for that in German lands. The Pope owned too much land. The Germans paid too many church taxes to Rome, and so on. Pretty soon, all sorts of people, learned people at least, all over German lands, were reading and discussing, and yes, mansplaining the 95 Theses. I just love this image. Of, this is the perfect, perfect illustration of mansplaining. Um, Luther was astonished, but he wasn't happy at all when one enterprising printer thought even the unlearned might be interesting, interested and have them translated into German. Lay people would get the wrong idea, feared Luther, because they did not know the culture of disputation with its exaggeration and posturing. They might even think he was criticizing the Pope, and he didn't want that. It was too late to recall the thesis, so he decided he'd better explain himself more clearly in another sermon or piece of writing in German to ordinary people. And this brings us to the main object of this gathering today, the new publication of Luther's Sermon on Indulgences and Grace. In February or March 1518, he preached against indulgences again in the city church, but more importantly, he had the main points of the sermon printed in the short eight-page tract, A Sermon on Indulgences and Grace. It included only about 20 points instead of 95 because he wanted to focus on the things that lay people most needed to understand about indulgences. And by the way, they did not include one word about the Pope. This sermon, and not the 95 Theses, was the first great bestseller of the time, eventually selling about 24,000 copies in the first two years. I'll tell the rest of the things uh, I wanted to clarify in the book just briefly, uh, even brutally, for the sake of time. Luther also wanted to explain the Theses more fully to the learned, and so he wrote his explanations of the 95 Theses, the proofs that he would have used if there had been an actual disputation. He sent those on to Rome. Uh, the Pope was not impressed. And, and with, by April or May, um, a tr the Pope had already started the works for a trial in the papal court in Rome against Luther, summoned Luther to come to Rome. And if he would not come, then his prince was to arrest him and send him there. That was another crucial part of the story that I wanted to play up. And that was, of course, Prince, prince Frederick, 
who was too cautious to support Luther overtly, but he supported him indirectly by refusing to send him to Rome. He, he didn't love Luther's view of indulgences, at first at least, because he liked indulgences himself. Uh, but he also didn't want one of his star professors being declared a heretic. That would have ruined things at the university, among other things. But anyway, he managed to drag things out for about a year after Luther was first uh, accused, partly because the Pope needed Frederick's vote in the upcoming election for a new German emperor. Then also uh, an yet another year of delay happened because of other circumstances by what else? A disputation. This one at Leipzig, and the most famous disputation of all from the time, which everyone, including the Pope, thought might settle things once and for all. Luther would be declared a heretic, therefore the Pope wouldn't have to do it through some complicated legal procedure. Um, but by now, Luther had studied the matter of the Pope's authority in a lot of detail, and for the first time he shocked himself and everyone else by openly stating that the Pope's authority was not a divine creation, but a human one. And as a human creation, it was fine, but it meant that the Pope's word could not, never be taken necessarily as God's. This shock to his system convinced Luther that he would be excommunicated and executed. So why not get even bolder in his writings? In May 1520, he published the first of his numerous tracts that would be openly critical of the Pope and continued with others ever after, which made him more popular than ever, including among printers. 20% of all things printed between 1520 and 30 in the Holy Roman Empire came from Luther's hand, and their reach was even greater when you uh, understand that most people heard the theses or heard his writings. They did not read them, but they heard them read, or they were paraphrased, or they were caricatured, or they were put into pictures. In June of 1520, two years after his trial had begun, Luther was finally excommunicated, at least provisionally, but that only increased his popularity. By the time he was finally summoned to the famous Diet of Worms in, to answer for his writings, and here is a scene from the time, um, early in 1521, he had become a folk hero with pe people cheering him on in the street, although he wished that they would cheer a little more for justification by faith. Well, after the Diet ended, Luther was famously kidnapped by his own Prince Frederick, hidden away for a year uh, at Frederick's mo most remote castle, the Wartburg. And I take the story through the end of his stay there up to the time that he returned to Wittenberg in March of 1522, because it was on that return that he really began his program of reform, which, by the way, turned out to be far more timid than his writings suggested it would be. Through Frederick's political skills, the support of sympathetic princes, and some good luck, Luther never was arrested by the pope or emperor, and he died in bed in 1545 rather than at the stake, which disappointed him, because he thought his old temptation returning, maybe he wasn't worthy enough after all. But nobody could have seen that in 1518 and 19 and 20 and 21 when everything was so up in the air and uncertain and nerve wracking. <clears throat> well, I try to clear other, clarify other events and characters too, including my favorite Leo X, who I am now convinced was God's special gift to historians who were trying to make the Reformation even more interesting than it was with Luther alone. But of course, this sort of clarifying is something that all historians try to do. And by itself, it doesn't necessarily convey the mood I was trying to create in the book or the spell I was trying to cast. Again, it's better to show such a thing than to tell, but showing would require reading excerpts, I suppose. And even though it was tempting to read the bit about Leo, I decided just to mention a few things the spell binding uh, might involve or spell casting might involve. One might be to call people by the names that contemporaries would have called them. So Luther is almost always Dr. Martin or Dr. Martinez in the book. Well, to his enemies, he was Luther, or something worse. If I always called him Luther, I think I would set up a distance that I didn't want. It might also involve using phrases and thoughts that people used, including even slurs and crude terms to try to enter their thinking. It might further involve learning their assumptions as much as possible, such as of the cosmos and of God and of the devil. It certainly involves using all of your senses in order to try to create a scene and describing clothing and furniture and lighting and things they were likely seeing, which you can hunt down, or at least responsibly suggest if you look hard enough. Mostly it involves trying to imagine yourselves in the shoes of the actors at various points and finding the evidence that might help you develop that. And it lastly involves when you do interpret and explain along the way, doing so subtly, weaving into the story rather than slap slapping blatantly on. So did it work? Did I cast a spell and write without the outcome and gigantic consequences in mind? Maybe. I'm sure you could find examples of me peeking ahead if you look hard enough. 
and even offering, of all things, explicit interpretations and explanations, such as why so many copies of his book were being sold. More importantly, did this manner of telling the story attract people so that it really was Luther for everybody? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, reviewers and people who bothered to write me mostly say that it is, uh, but it certainly hasn't attracted everybody. In fact, it doesn't seem to be selling as well as books like Professor Roper's, which were written for historians as well as for general readers. Of course, I never check my Amazon rankings, but I'm strictly guessing that there has been on average about, she has been about 23,714 ahead of me in the last few months. <laughs> Yet most people in the U.S. seem to be reading the biography of Eric Metaxas, which because it is a big seller, I out of pure jealousy may of course cr criticize for all of its flourishes and spoilers and looking ahead and cliches. But it also makes me reflect, maybe readers like their famous stories that way. Maybe it reassures them that they have invested the time and money wisely on a universally recognized famous event. I conclude the same thing as I watch various documentaries and films about Luther. Maybe cliches and knowing the outcome as you go are what people really want from famous stories. But I'd still write my book the same way again. To me, it's better to understand a story, famous or otherwise, in its own time as much as possible. This isn't just to be pedantic or to see the story more accurately than otherwise, or even as the great historian Garrett Mattingly used to say, to do justice to the dead. It's about doing justice to ourselves as well. As historians know full well, the more we idolize or demonize the great and the famous, the more we take them out of their world, the more we treat their stories as if they were meant to be, then the greater the distance we put between us and them, chronologically and psychologically, and the harder it is to learn from them or relate to them. <clears throat> Instead, we can only marvel or despise as distant spe spectators like the ancient Greeks watching their gods. Of course, it's not always easy to relate to the famous. They probably do have extraordinary gifts and vices that we do not. And it's not easy to understand the different world they lived in, and thus to be able to do what Emerson urged, to imagine ourselves as Roman or Turk or executioner or monk. The past truly is other. But I disagree with the idea that, like the wicked witch of the East, the past is legally, morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably, reliably, and really most sincerely dead. I understand the idea behind this sentiment, that we are too quick to connect the past to ourselves and to flatten differences, and that we ought to see the past as it was. But after we've done that, there has to be something in it that lives in the present. A friend recently noted to me that historians like to say two contradictory things. The past is a foreign country, and there's nothing new under the sun. Maybe that's because we like to say whichever is convenient at the moment. But I think it's also likely it's because both are true at the same time. The past really is wondrously other, yet it's precisely when we get a glimpse of a world in its otherness that we are best in a position to work out how that might translate to ourselves and how we might relate even to the great. Thus, to Luther's courage and fear and intellect and uncertainty and stress and prejudice and repetitiveness and really nasty temper. And it's precisely when we don't see a story as somehow inevitable that we can better see how for Luther, as for us, life was uncertain and joyous and painful and terrifying. In fact, it is always, however you want to understand the term, an act of faith. And that, I think, is what I hoped readers would ultimately see. Thanks for listening.